Now then, good to be with you all again. And so, yeah, I've gone and bought myself a new 2020 27 inch iMac. Try saying that a few times fast. Now, this video is a little different from my other videos as I'm straying away from my normal photography subject matter. And I know that there are wads of other channels out there talking about the same subject and going into a lot more techno babble than I can hear. But I'm certain that there are many other photographers out there wondering whether or not to get an iMac now or wait for the Apple Silicon Macs to appear. And so I thought you might want to hear from a like-minded person. Now a couple of weeks or so have passed since I received the new iMac and recorded that opening segment. And so I've now had time to play with my new toy. And whilst this is actually the first iMac I've ever owned, or even used for that matter, it's not my first Mac. I've been using 15 inch MacBook Pro since 2010 as my main machine. But my current machine is now six years old and struggling at times. Funny enough, ever since I upgraded from Lightroom 6 to the subscription model. But that's a completely different story, which I don't want to get bogged down with here. Originally, I contemplated getting the 16 inch MacBook Pro when that came out. But I then re-evaluated my needs for a laptop altogether and decided that much of what I needed for portability could now be met through my iPad Pro. So when the 2020 iMacs were announced in August, still on Intel and still sporting the same old, tired, or some might call classic design, I had a decision to make. Now part of that decision making involves the fact that I still occasionally use Windows for such things as Microsoft Access and a few other bits and bobs. And what is clear is that the new Apple Silicon will not run bootcamp and possibly virtualization software such as Parallels, which I use, might also not be able to run Windows. But accepting that I do need Windows occasionally, my choices were simple. One, swap over completely now to a new Windows machine and move away from Macs altogether, which at this moment in time, I didn't really want to do, as I quite like the integration of the ecosystem, despite the Apple tax, as some would call it. Or two, hang on and get a suitable Apple Silicon device when released, and get a second Windows machine then for those occasions when I need Windows, or even keep my existing MacBook for that function. Now this seemed a reasonable option, but my MacBook was becoming painfully slow at times, despite a fresh rebuild. Or three, the option I went with, upgrade my Mac now to an Intel Mac and continue accessing Windows from a single machine and then revisit options one and two sometime in the future if my needs for a mix of Windows and Mac environments still exist. However, the benefits for hanging on for the new Apple Silicon devices are quite compelling. The new Apple Silicon machines are expected to bring significant performance improvements. And of course, for some, being an early adopter of new kit is part of the fun but for others, it can bring unwanted risks. Now, that's not to suggest that there'll be problems with the new hardware, but at the very least, you might have some compatibility issues with older software or peripherals. But of course, as the 2020 iMacs are amongst the last Intel Macs, the main question is, how long will they be supported for? Well, Apple have stated that they're committed to supporting Intel Macs for years to come, which is a rather vague, meaningless statement. By definition, years is plural. And so the only thing that can be taken with certainty is that Apple will support them for two years at least. But realistically, looking at Apple's approach to date, devices are usually supported for between five and seven years, at which point they're usually declared obsolete. However, if you look at the last switchover back in 2006, when Apple moved on to Intel, the iMac G5 was only compatible with the next OS release, Leopard. Thereafter, with the arrival of Snow Leopard in 2009, the G5 was no longer compatible. So that was just three years. So if you're gonna buy an Intel Mac now, buy with your eyes open and consider the spec that you're going to go for and how long you intend to keep the machine for. Which brings me nicely to the spec that I've chosen for my machine. Now, the prices I'll be referring to in this video are UK pricing. But coincidentally, on the Apple site, these are currently the same pound for US dollar. No doubt due to the fact that in the UK, pricing is inclusive of VAT, value added tax or sales tax. Originally, as you do, I contemplated getting the 10 core i9 processor and the 5700 XT video option with its 16 gig of RAM, which would have been nice, but would have also added another 900 pounds to the price. 
So after much deliberation, I concluded that the eight core i7 would be plenty for me, along with the standard 5500 XT video. The performance gains against the cost overhead that both the i9 and the 5700 XT options would potentially provide for me would only impact on a small percentage of my system's usage. I'm not a gamer, and although I do some video work, I'm not too bothered if it takes a little longer to do the export, as I'm not doing these tasks all of the time. I'll just go get a cup of tea or something if needs be. But I did go with some options. Naturally, I went with the standard 8GB of RAM, which I've since upgraded to 32GB with two 16GB third-party RAM sticks at a cost of £114, instead of the whopping £600 that Apple wanted for this. I also upped the storage slightly. I've gone for the 1TB option instead of the standard 512GB. Now local storage isn't as important to me as I mainly use network storage. So I've therefore also opted for the 10 gigabit ethernet option, which at £100 is a relatively cheap upgrade. Well, relatively cheap as far as Apple upgrades go. Of course, I'd have preferred if it came as standard. Eventually, I'll upgrade my network storage to 10 gigabit as well, which hopefully will allow me to work directly on files for video work. But one feature for which this iteration of the iMac has received a lot of attention is the nano screen option, which at £500 might seem like an indulgence. Well, it's an indulgence I've opted for. Whilst I might not garner benefit all of the time from the 10 cores or the 16 gig video options, the screen is the one part of the system that you interact with all of the time. And so it pays to get the screen that best meets your needs. And I have to say, I'm extremely pleased with the nano option. Comparing my new iMac screen to the old MacBook Pro, there is very little reflection to be seen, even when angled to the window. When waving my arms about against a blank screen, you can see a little bit of movement on the iMac, but it's not as defined as with the MacBook. But of course, it's when running apps like Lightroom that's more important. Reflection can be an issue at times on my old MacBook, though it's difficult to accurately show this on video, unfortunately. And it's fair to say that the issues are more noticeable on darker parts of the screen or when working on darker images but I don't see any significant issues at all with the nano screen. Even shining a head torch onto the screens, the difference between the two is noticeable. With the iMac, you only see a small pinprick. Now, naturally, you're not normally gonna be wearing a head torch whilst using your computer, but it can make a difference if you have bright lighting around you. However, not everyone will benefit from this option, and indeed, there are some concerns over the screen's durability, as Apple issue very explicit instructions for cleaning it and provide a special cloth for the purpose. Some though might say that it's a waste of money and that I could just as easily close the blinds as I have done for recording this video. I could, but I don't want to. I have a very nice view from my window, which I like to look out of whilst I'm working. So how does my new machine perform? Well, I've run some of those geeky bench tests that everyone else seems to focus on and got the following scores using Geekbench 5, as you can see. Now, in the single core and multi-core test, the results demonstrate a 58 and 145% improvement for the iMac over the MacBook respectively. Whilst in the OpenCL and Metal tests, the iMac provides a whopping 2,016% and a respectable 1,773% improvement over the MacBook's discrete graphics option. I know this sounds great, but quite frankly, I haven't a clue how it relates to the real world. So as it's Lightroom that interests me more, I did a couple of quick comparison tests between the two machines. Doing a photo merge panorama of the same 10 raw images taken by my Canon EOS R, with the edge fill option selected, took one minute 28 seconds on my MacBook Pro and 51 seconds on the iMac. So a 37 second or 42% gain for the new iMac over the MacBook Pro. And doing an export of 100 RAW files to low res JPEGs took three minutes 34 seconds on the MacBook Pro and two minutes one seconds on the iMac which gives a 1 minute 33 second or 43% gain for the iMac over the MacBook Pro. So after seven years of system improvements, the performance gains within Lightroom appears to be around 42 to 43%. I actually thought, maybe hoped, that the improvements would be more significant. 
But of course, speed improvements aren't the whole story. I've also now got access to the sidecar function that allows an iPad to be used as an additional monitor. And whilst I haven't had time to go into detail with this yet, so far, I've been a little bit underwhelmed by it, but we'll see how that goes. Also, I've got a great monitor, which I'm very happy with. And I'm now able to use my older monitor as a second screen. Well, for however long it lasts anyhow. I'm sure many of you will have your own views as to whether it's still worth buying an Intel Mac or not. If you can wait for the new Apple Silicon machines and don't need access to Windows, then wait. It'll be interesting though to see what performance gains Apple Silicon actually provides. But remember, even the 40 odd percent performance increase my iMac provides over my old tired laptop for aspects of Lightroom only amounts to a couple of minutes for some tasks and seconds for others, even though the Geekbench scores suggest even greater improvements. But I suppose it all comes down to the tasks that you're actually doing. Naturally, the age of your current machine will obviously determine the ultimate gain to be achieved from the swap over to Apple Silicon. I would expect that had I waited, the performance increase in those Lightroom functions will be a lot higher than the 40 odd percent I've seen. But by how much? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. But if you need a new machine now, then the 2020 iMac at the right spec is a great machine. No doubt when the new shiny toys do come out, I'll be drooling and maybe wishing I'd waited. But for the time being, I'm content. And I know that when I do ultimately upgrade, that there'll be something newer and shinier available. But what about you? Are you hanging on? Or have you, or are you, getting an Intel Mac? Please feel free to share your views in the comments below in order to provide others with a more rounded picture. Okay, that's it for the time being. I should be back to my general photography stuff next time. So until then, many thanks for watching. Take care. TTFN, ta-ta for now. But before I go, I just want to thank everyone who subscribed to this channel. Hopefully I won't have lost too many from this video. And to announce that somehow or other, by either a miracle or a failure in the login system, I've managed to amass a thousand subscribers. Who would have believed it? And as this is probably the only major milestone I'll reach with this channel, I thought I'd celebrate. So a big thank you to you all. Oh, dear. Oh, they're awful. <laughs> <laughs>